in the times of, uh, of technology nowadays, we find ourselves in the Facebook and uh, Twitter and WhatsApp, but also had the photographers. But most importantly, it was the artists, and it's still the artists, who portray what we, see, we find in life today. And artists should be celebrated. And I want us to celebrate um, Uncle Joe, especially even though it's a few, few days shy from uh, the 26th of August. These are the unsung heroes mm -hmm. of Namibia, and we should appreciate them. <laughs> so with those few words, I'm not here to, 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 to make a speech. Let me leave it to my brother from UNAM. And I'm happy that uh, our professors, Dr. Van Roy, Dupisani uh, are here, because uh, they are the, yes. I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me give it to you, John. Uh, thanks a lot. I had to think a lot. What, what am I going to speak about? The art exhibition. Um, in fact, this morning I called Uncle Joe. And I was actually hoping that it was cancelled so that I can prepare again. <laughs> so I called him at 6 and said, but he didn't pick up, he called it later. Um, is it still on? Mm. Then I got the bad news that yes, everything is still on. And, uh, but in the course of the day, I've been thinking about it a lot, and uh, I did my, my own digging to try to understand uh, Uncle Joe, and I actually discovered that there the, the are a lot of people who could have made a significant contribution, but due to the, to the center, to the activities of the center, they are sometimes pushed to the periphery. And I think really that, that is really what I thought I should speak about as a political scientist. As you know, many of you, um, we left Viva Viva Politics, we don't sing songs and clap hands anymore. We are back to the lecture from the university, <laughs> uh, where we are concerned with, with, with issues of knowledge. You spend enough time to try to understand. Uh, I, I used to look at art as some ugly buildings, that drawings. Uh, I used to think that I could actually draw better, uh, but I didn't understand now. I now understand better, and now understand art as the activity of the mind. As I really wanted to speak about today, uh, it's about social dominance. It's a well-grounded uh, theory of both in the social sciences, but it speaks essentially about how societies are arranged around hierarchies. Uh, it speaks about three things, essentially. The first thing is mythology, types of myths that are used to carry society. The first one is paternalistic myth. This paternalistic myth speaks about the hegemonic group. The hegemonic group is a group that is in charge of all powers, occupying all important positions in society. Now, this type of myth are created to say that this hegemonic group that leads society is the most important group. It serves society. Uh, it carries the wider mandate. Uh, it's very important the rest of us must uh, respect it. So through all this cultural, economic, and political congregation, these myths are reproduced so that we hold this group in high regard. They are the Alpha and Omega. and they, are, they have a monopoly of knowledge. We must listen to them. The second type of myth is called reciprocal myth. This is the type of myth where uh, you are told that the hegemonic group and the out group, those that are not controlling the means of production, are actually equal. This type of myth are reproduced through the state uh, narrative. For example, one Namibia, one nation. So if I'm in Babylon and you are in Kleine Kope, when we are told one Namibia, one nation, we actually believe that we are equal. <laughs> so, so these myths are continue to be reproduced. For example, when the new narrative of the Namibian house. So whether you are closer to the fridge eating the rations and I'm in the fence of the Namibian house, we start believing that we are in one house. So that's the type of, of myth that are reproduced. The third uh, myth is what is called the sacred myth. The sacred myth is the type of myth that project the hegemonic group 
as the anointed ones, the one who possess all sort of wisdoms, the one that is uh, allowed by God to rule until Jesus returns. So at the end of the day, when all these myths are put together, we have a type of society that worships. We are developing a concept, uh, I must apologize in, in advance, it will be published, we are, what we are calling the bullshitization of society. So what is happening with the bullshitization of society? It means you can have a president or former president who goes to Vavis Bay, complains about the houses that have been built at Vavis Bay, but while the president is complaining, his daughter is building in Ochoarongo the same houses. Bullshitization of society. Or you have a governor, for example, who closed down a school for political reasons, but all his kids are either engineers or doctors. Bullshitization of society. So those type of myth pushes everyone away and consolidates the center. The center monopolizes knowledge. No one else can interpret what is wrong with us in society. And those actors, part of the hegemonic group, become so strong such that you can't escape anyway. Sometimes you're really just tired from Monday to Saturday, you're listening to politicians every day. Then you go to Sunday to church just to, you know, unwind. While you're just there, after the first song, the person who's preaching is a politician, again, the person you're running away from. <laughs> then maybe you drive, you go to your village just to relax, you just to discover that uh, the person is a, is a headman. You go to a nearby school, to speak to the children, then you hear that the person is a patron. Almost everywhere you go, the hegemonic groups uh, is there. So it becomes so lonely in trying to confront this social dominance because it's, it's concentrated. We are still believing that the ruling party is the sole and authentic representation of Namibian people 25 years after independence. The fundamental question is, how does one generation dominate and control society in most profound ways for 25 years. Not the party, a generation. Because what you have is not necessarily a party or anything, but it's a generation that dominates and controls society for 25 years in those profound ways. Sometimes those answers are difficult to find. From the look of things, we are unable to find them in the general way of doing things because of what? Bullshitization of society. <laughs> For example, if you hear that, you see a politician saying, bullshit is not necessarily a, a, a swear word. Because if you look at the dictionary, the dictionary tells us that disingenuous, hypocritical, false, you know, misrepresentation, those things. For example, if a politician says, to us as young people, if a politician says that he hates corruption. Then we know very well that his office is full of his family members and lovers. His speech is bullshit. That is what we mean in that context. So it becomes very difficult now. So we look for answers. We look for clues. Where do we find meaning as young people? Who can understand us better? Because sometimes all we want is just a person to say, I understand. I understand my children. I understand your struggle. I understand what is wrong. I think this is the way we, we go. It's such a scandalous situation to have a generation that is confronting its own. We are in a society where the pigs is eating its own children. Then they come people like Uncle Joe. We're discussing with Henry there. Uh, when they saw Joe, they think it's some, but they were asking, like, who's that Joe guy? They don't know it's him. He comes to our conversation on Facebook every day. Anything that we post, he participates in those conversations. Agree with us, disagree with us, but he's just there. He's just there in our suffering, he's just there in our sorrow. So as we are running away from bullshitization of society, we find shelter in people like Uncle Joe. We come here and we, we saw the, there's a Bible there, and there's a Namibian map, and there's a ladder for people going into the, you know, trying to think. But some of us have questions that we are told that we must accept our suffering because Jesus is going to come one day. We are told to count our blessings and not our sorrows. 
we sometimes wonder that where was Jesus for 500 years when we were under exploitation? So because there's evidence of him not being available for 500 years, we are also thinking and traumatized by the thought that he may not come for the next 500 years. But we, when we look, we see pictures like that, as we run away from bushitization of society, uh, we, we try to find meaning. We try to find comfort. What I'm, I'm really trying to speak about, I'm trying to speak about the new dimension of art that you may not be able to know. Art as comfort to us as young people who are not provided for in society. When you provide for people, it's not just food to eat. It's also about peace of mind. Yeah? How many of those people that complain about young people really sit down with young people? We are not talking about you telling me that uh, good things come to those who wait. We are a generation of young people who are saying, because those verses, those analogies of good things come to those who wait, is part of bullshitization of society. Because you want me to be basically standing here waiting for two things. Life expectancy in our, in our country, in Africa, is apparently some say it's 48, some say it's, uh, it's, it's 52. So if you are 35 today, count how many years you are left with, maybe 10 or 12 years left. If you don't find a house in 12 years, you are likely to die without finding one. But what we are saying is that we are a determined generation. Uh, we are trying to find new friends. And we are excited that we are finding friends in the art. Sometimes it doesn't have to do anything. A simple poem like the one that is there that our sacred land matters. You read about it, then you say to yourself, there's somebody that understands us. There's somebody that sympathizes with us. He doesn't have to give us money. He doesn't have to toy toy with us. He doesn't have to challenge those like we are challenging. But he's challenging them in certain ways. When you look at the beauty of art, sometimes I used to come and say, what does this uh, image show? But our understanding as we try to find comfort in the art is that we can sit there, three of us, and see different things. And we begin having conversation with people that don't speak. Because I see a feast, maybe this is a hegemonic group that is showing the rest of the that they are in charge. <laughs> but if you speak to Uncle Joe, he will give you something else. <laughs> if you speak to Mao, you will also see something else. But what are we saying? We are trying to we find comfort. We are having conversation with them. Conversation that will distract us probably from really just running to a house of somebody. Because sometimes we get crazy thoughts in our, in our head. Because we are saying, if you want to demolish my house, all politicians in our country, we know where they stay. They don't stay outside the window. I mean, if I come and just deal with your aluminum window, it's like 4,000. No? Malicious damage to property is like 200. I can find But when I come and see the art, when I come and see the art, I'm taken away from those ideas. And really, sometimes there are nice arts, nice poems, which is there. So we really look at art as the activity of the mind. We are finding our friends in the art, people that listen to us. Art, of course, is, uh, is not respected. If I was an artist, I would actually think that we need to do things differently. Because at Independence Day, uh, when you consolidate those sacred myths that uh, this is the anointed uh, hegemonic group, the art will come there and display people clap hands and they sit back. After that, the cars take them to their places, they go eat, and then you go up for hot dogs and all those things. But if you could project society in such ways, and when you project our suffering, you give us another vision, another opportunity to engage with our reality, to engage with our problems. So I really wanted to speak about art from that perspective of a young person, as we see it. We see art as our friend. We see Uncle Joe as the artist, the senior artist in our country, as somebody through his art who's providing for. We will come here until the 2nd of September just to have conversation about with those pictures. When you speak about conversation with those pictures, not that we are crazy. Just somebody who's understanding our realities. Somebody who's understanding the type of conversation that we want to have. But if we can have that good understanding that art can make that significant contribution. I don't think that 
our politicians and our leaders, from politicians to everyone. I don't think we really think about the human heart. Before I start fighting, I must have this conversation with my head. Before I start confronting you, I must have this conversation with my heart and my head. So the beginning of everything that we do is the mind. As I said, so instead of dealing with your aluminum window, I come and have conversation with the eyes. So I begin to look at things differently. And three of us come there and debate, what does this mean? When you ask that question, what comes clear, as political scientists who call it epistemology, how do you know what you know? The study of knowledge. Even as we complain about politicization of, of politics and society, we are trying to theorize about that question. And art is playing a very fundamental role. And I really just want to thank uh, Uncle Joe for being with us in those conversations. Sometimes it gets very tough with young people, you know, and the way we express ourselves. We express ourselves because of that agency. Uh, we, we actually think that we should not sugarcoat anything. Because if we sugarcoat things, we will not be able to understand. And we, lastly, I want to give Uncle Joe uh, an assignment to redefine politics. For example, we want to find a way to either get politicians to stop talking about the bucket system and to start explaining it is the way it is. There is no such thing as a bucket system. There is no system. When you say it's a system, you are making it look complicated, as if it's like some IT system or system of a bureaucracy. It's not a system. What it means is that if you are living in one bedroom shack, mommy, daddy, and the kids, is that daddy in the middle of a night, if mommy has cooked enough food, he will uh, take a bucket in the same room, because it's dark outside, and shit in that bucket. When we say we shit, it means his feces and his urines are in the same. Then mommy wakes up two hours later, and mommy shit on top of daddy's shit with, with her, her urine also there. Then you wake up in the two hours later, you also shit on top of your mommy and your daddy's shit. And then in the morning you, you carry the bucket, you go and empty the bucket. What are you doing? You are emptying your mommy and your daddy and your sister's shit. So this is what they are talking about, the bucket system. That's what they don't want to explain. So it becomes acceptable when they say a bucket system. But when you say that we are shitting on top of our parents' shit, that's uncomfortable for them. They would not want to speak about those things. So we want to give Uncle Joe an assignment to please deconstruct the so-called bucket system. Maybe to have drawing for us. To <laughs> drawing for us so that we can come here and have conversation with a bucket system. <laughs> And think about it. And sometimes we really get very angry. People laugh about it. But what happened to the psychological impact? Mm. If you have a stomach problem, maybe you don't wake, you wake up in the middle of a night with one bedroom, mommy and daddy are waking up. What are the chances of you? What, what is it that you are likely to see? Now, would you want to have your child seeing you having sex? But this is really what happens out there. Children wake up in the middle of the night, they are likely to bump into their parents having sex. Or their parents undressing. So we need places for comfort where we can come and have conversation about our realities. Those guys don't understand our problems. They don't understand our suffering. Uncle Joe understands. He can have conversation with us. Not condemn us as a generation, but really have a conversation with us. Some, some people are saying, yeah, these youth are ill-disciplined, but their children are convicted criminals. Bullshitization of society. So I really want to thank you, Uncle Joe, and uh, those of you that came to support. What we can promise you is that we don't like the scene here. Uh, we think that there should be a lot of young people who are engaging in the art. We take responsibility. Uh, art should not just be taken as a hobby. Like for us, the enlightened few, university lecturers, the artists, uh, professionals, consultants, photographers, lawyers. It, it's really unfortunate. I think a lot of people out there, they are missing 
a good opportunity. We, we need all, to, all of us to take responsibility. As activists, we are taking responsibility. Of course, we came maybe with five or ten young people who are here, but uh, we wanted for, for, for clear reason, I never put it on Facebook or WhatsApp or anything, because we wanted to see this. So we can promise you that we take responsibility to the promotion of art. When you have events, if you want us to be there, we'll be here from now on, because we have discovered new friends. We have dif discovered that we can have conversation with people that don't speak. People who understand our realities, people who can help us with therapy and deal with issues of our souls and minds. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, that was uh, very enlightening. But now we'll hear from, as they say in English, the horse's mouth, Uncle Joe, to tell us exactly, in short, what he has to show us. I'm used to telling what to say. I'm used to that. Because we're always, we're always told one nation, one Namibia. Yeah. So it's like that. There's one thing up there. First of all, of all I want to thank Job for taking his time. He said he's got a very busy schedule. And I think it's spot on what he said. Uh, I can live in uh, Marine Town now. Every morning I walk from a house, no, mostly uh, weekend mornings, and I walk in a place called Takarania. And there are small houses. And it's sometimes the house is only about three meters or four meters by four meters. Eh? And you come on a Saturday morning there, you walk past there, you greet them, you see mother, child, and three children, mother, father, and three children sitting outside the house. And you wonder, do they sleep in the same room, in the same little pond up there? So Job is right when he says that, you know? I saw it myself. Then I greet them, but they stay in the little pond up. So imagine people, uh, that's why I call it a paradox. Honestly, I call it a paradox. We are all happy, and Africans are always happy, but always, Africans are always a paradox. One thing that I want to also bring to your attention is up there, at the entrance, for the whole duration of the exhibition, will be a drum of UNAM, which is for this course of housing and land. Please, the UNAM students have provided that up there. I want to thank Mr. Uh, Mr. Vincent, uh, Mr. Vincent for providing us with a drum of the UNAM students. It's, I'm very happy for that. Give him a round of applause, please. <laughs> Every little penny that goes into there will be for a good cause. And some of us can afford even to put $10 in, or even more.